Hi everyone, my name is Bo and I'm happy to welcome you in our presentation. Today we're going to talk about intergroup relations. In the following slides we'll try to answer the question if contact can reduce prejudice between groups. So let's start with an example. Chop and colleagues found that if African American and other ethnic minorities in the US had more friendships with whites, over time those friendships predicted less support for ethnic activism that would promote the equal rights of African Americans in the US. This can in part explain why blacks would, for example, vote for President Trump, even though he clearly disadvantages them. So why would blacks who are friends with whites support policies that make them worse off? Keep this example in mind, because throughout the presentation, we will give you clues to why this could be. So, a quick outline of today's presentation. We will first present the contact theory and how it has evolved from its origins to present. We'll also mention some methodological issues in contact research. Next, we'll look into studies which have shown unexpected negative effects of intergroup contact. And we'll also present possible mechanisms underlying such paradoxical findings. We will conclude with a summary and future directions for creating optimal intergroup contact. So we will first give you some background on prejudice and contact theory. Let's start by determining what prejudices precisely are. Alpert stated that prejudices are feelings toward an individual or the whole group without prior experience of contacting those persons that could cause those feelings. Since prejudices are not based on experience, where can they possibly come from? There are many theories on this subject and I will explain some of them to you on the next slide. First, according to Adorno and Ising, prejudice is the result of specific personality social ideological attitudes. For example, authoritarianism is one of the traits closely linked to prejudice. Another index linked to prejudice is social dominance orientation, or SDO, which correlates with hierarchy preference, sexism, racism, chauvinism, patriotism, and nationalism. In a second theory by Devine, you can divide people into two groups, those with high and low prejudice towards others. Even though both groups hold the same cultural stereotypes, one group has less prejudice than the other because they can distract themselves from these thoughts and focus on positive or neutral aspects of the others. A third theory by Campbell regarded prejudices as a strategy of survival and as a fight for limited resources. So prejudices are just an excuse to fight with the outgroup. The most important theory according to us is that by Teifel and Turner. They say that prejudices result from the need for self-categorization, thanks to which the individual is able to determine his, his or her own identification and thus existence and affiliation. Nevertheless, prejudices can probably never be eliminated completely, and for a good reason. Prejudices are useful for creating quick associations and thereby saving cognitive capacity to cope with unknown or threatening situations. So, objectively, prejudices are not bad, they're even necessary. However, this does not change the fact that we should work on them to reduce intergroup injustice. So, is there a way in which we can reduce prejudice? Alport created a theory that explained how one can influence prejudices and reduce their significance in intergroup relations. He said that under four conditions, contact can decrease prejudices. And those conditions are equal status, intergroup cooperation, common goals, and support of authorities, law, and custom. It means that both groups should have similar economic and cultural backgrounds. They should also have common goals because this would benefit mutual understanding and foster cooperation. Intergroup cooperation enables members of intergroups to create a new temporary merged group with the outgroup because it is beneficial for achieving common group goals. It is important that the two groups agree with each other that they need each other. And the last condition is support of authorities and law. It gives group members a sense of the contact as a legal and a right thing to do. After this original formulation of contact theory, other researchers found evidence for and built further on Alport's theory. Firstly, Aronson's idea of a jigsaw classroom is based on Alport's theory. In a jigsaw classroom, students from different social groups are brought together and have to cooperate. Secondly, decategorization is also an extension of Alport's theory. 
in which context breaks down previous conceptual categories, for example, by emphasizing common goals rather than intergroup differences. It could be understood as a mechanism of prejudice reduction because existing categories are reorganized. Thirdly, pedigroups try to make context theory more generalizable across situations and groups by proposing a stage model. In a first stage, called the decategorization stage, participants' personal identity should be emphasized to reduce anxiety and promote interpersonal liking. In the second stage, then, the individual's social category should be made salient to achieve generalization of this positive effect to the outgroup as a whole. Finally, there's the recategorization stage, where participants' group identities are replaced with a more superordinate group. So this changes their group identities from us versus them to a more inclusive we feeling. This support for context theory can even be found with computer simulations. Grimm and colleagues made a computer simulation model of reducing prejudice based on the premises of contact theory. They recreated potential contact of two groups with the simulation. They built for this both on game theory and outward system theory. Game theory is the study of mathematical models of strategic interaction among rational decision makers. It's used in many fields of social systems and computer science. The most popular example of game theory is the prisoner dilemma, which presents different strategies of two people who, working together or acting against each other, work to the detriment of or for the benefit of each other. This makes these two people dependent on each other. With this basic setup of the prisoner's dilemma, Grimm et al. varied the four conditions of the contact theory which we already mentioned, and they looked at the effect on intergroup contact in those simulations. On the right side of the slide, you can see some of the examples of how the groups mixed when they varied the conditions of Alport's theory. Game theory and the prisoner's dilemma are very interesting and useful in social psychology, so if you're interested, you can find the link in the comments below the slides. So, Grimm's model in motion looks like the one in this recording. They created computational mathematical models that reflect the members of two groups. The model is created using appropriately set parameters that simulate the relationships between those groups. And this model showed that prejudices disappear between two groups depending on Alport's four premises. During constant interaction, prejudices cease to be a profitable strategy and therefore cease to be used. So, even though there's been a lot of research on contact theory, like we just showed, there's still some methodological issues with a lot of this research. So, um, the few things that mainly have been criticized with studies on contact theory research are listed on this slide. Firstly, many studies use self-report as a method, for example, with surveys and questionnaires. These can reflect researchers' own biased ideas instead of capturing respondents' opinions. Nevertheless, there's evidence that these self-report methods can be valid measures of intergroup contact. Secondly, research about contact theory is mostly based on cross-sectional studies and not longitudinal ones, so we don't have insight into the directionality of effects that we find. However, lately longitudinal studies are also becoming more frequent. Thirdly, researchers have conceptualized terms like contact or prejudice in very different ways. And this means that they have given different definitions for these terms, which threatens validity because they are measuring some sometimes different constructs. Finally, research often neglects social contexts, which is a known issue in all kinds of psycho psychological studies. But also in this respect, progress has been made. For example, some researchers try to replicate findings under different cultural contexts, and that is precisely what Kenda and colleagues did a cross-cultural validation to test Alport's condition of equality in contact. So, more precisely, Kenda and colleagues tested Alport's assumption that equal status is necessary in intergroup contact to improve intergroup attitudes, and they tested this at the cultural level. So, they did this with a meta-analysis of contact between groups and prejudice. Importantly, this is an improvement over many other contact studies because it emphasizes the role of context. Their main hypothesis was that the contact prejudice association would be stronger in egalitarian cultures and weaker in more hierarchical cultures. This would be in line with Alport, who thought that equality in the contact is an important prerequisite for contact to improve intergroup relations. You can see the three sub-hypotheses along with the results in the slide. 
When we look at the first chart, we see that higher cultural egalitarianism in society indeed goes with stronger negative associations between intergroup contact and prejudice. In the second chart, we see significantly weaker associations of contact prejudice in a more hierarchical cultural context. The last chart shows us that weaker contact prejudice associations in more hierarchical cultures were replicated using culture level social dominance orientation as a moderator. So, if the context situation is equal, but still the overarching cultural values are hierarchical, the current context has a lower ability to reduce pr prejudice. This means that culture and context situation add up to determine the strength of the context prejudice association. So, for example, in Denmark, which is an egalitarian culture, there's a strong negative correlation between contact and prejudice. But in China, on the other hand, cultural values are more hierarchical. So there, even if the context situation is equal, the relation between contact and prejudice will be weak. So, as we've seen, research on contact theory proves that to improve relations between groups, it's very useful to bring the advantage and disadvantage groups together. But more recent research is also sh showing something quite paradoxical, namely that intergroup contact can have negative effects. As we will see, positive intergroup contact can undermine effort to strive for equality and social justice for disadvantaged group members. And one of the first people to investigate those unintended or negative effects on, of intergroup contact was Sagai. So the finding by Sagai was basically a game changer for research on contact theory. In the first experiment, he investigated whether the positive contact between a disadvantaged and advantaged group will stop the groups from recognizing existing inequalities because positive outgroup attitudes are created, like Elport would say. This was tested in a lab experiment with more than 200 students. They divided the students so that in each trial there were two groups of three students. Each time, one of those groups was the advantage group because they had power over course credits that they could divide between the two groups. And a disadvantaged group could only distribute marbles, which are basically not worth anything. Um, in the experiment, those two groups of three interacted with each other and focused either on commonalities or on differences between their groups. For the outcomes, they measured the attitudes toward the outgroup, the attention of each of the groups to the inequality between them, whether the disadvantaged group expected fairness from the advantaged group in a form of equal credit allocation, and whether the relations were actually fair by looking at how the advantaged group allocated the credits. And Remember that, in line with Alport, the interactions where groups focused on intergroup com commonalities should be most beneficial to improve intergroup relations. So, here you can see some of the important findings. In brief, they found that commonality-focused contact did increase positive attitudes more than difference-focused contact did, just like Alport predicted. But other important findings that are not immediately derived from Alport are that disadvantaged groups paid less attention to inequality after commonality-focused contact and the disadvantaged group expected more fair allocation of credits after criminality-focused contact. But importantly, the advantaged groups did not behave any more fair after criminality versus difference-focused contact, and they never gave the disadvantaged group a fair amount of credits. Thus, this shows that the disadvantaged group has a false expectation of equality after criminality-focused contact. So even though attitudes improved, as is in line with Alpert's theory, Alpert did Elport did not predict that the disadvantaged group would have false expectations of outgroup fairness after commonality focused contact. So, in their next study, they investigated if such false expectations of fairness also occur in a real life context and if these expectations can prevent a disadvantaged group from trying to improve their social position. They tested this by taking questionnaires from Arabs in Israel and asking about their relations with Jews. In Israel, Jews are socially advantaged and Arabs are disadvantaged. So again, in line with contact theory reasoning, they looked at the positive context that the positive contact that Arabs reported with Jews, and also what their attitudes were towards Jews. They also measured how much attention the groups paid to the social inequalities, and if they see their social positions as fair. Finally, they also measured if the Arabs were motivated for social change, for example, by asking them items like if they would support policies that give equal rights to Jews and Arabs. So, 
the results show that positive contact with Jews is indeed associated with positive attitudes towards the Jews, just like Albert said. But like in the first study, we can again see some paradoxical or unintended effects of the positive contact, here highlighted in red. When there was positive contact with Jews, the Arabs paid less attention to their unequal social position and they thought that Jews were more fair towards them. All of this, the positive attitudes, less attention to inequality and more perceived outgroup fairness, mediated the link between positive contact and less support for social change. So this means that the Arabs who had more positive contact with Jews were less likely to support policies that would give them equal social status as the Jews. So to summarize what we can learn from those two studies by Sekai is that positive contact with an advantage group, with an advantage group makes members of disadvantaged groups see the intergroup relations in a way that is unrealistically equal. And this false perception of equality is problematic because then there is no incentive for them to pursue social change. This means that there is a negative side effect of Alpert's condition of equality in contact. It distracts people's attention away from inequalities and gives a false idea of fairness. And this eventually leads to less support for social change. So, Sagai found that positive intergroup contact has negative and unintended effects. In this section, we'll try to find out if there's more evidence to support such paradoxical effects. So it turns out that after Sagai, a lot of researchers have investigated these negative effects of positive intergroup contact for the disadvantaged group. And these paradoxical effects have been found in many different kinds of advantaged and disadvantaged groups. Now, we will give two examples of studies which have also found a paradoxical effect similar to those of Sagai, and then a big study that confirms these effects are real. The first example is a study by Singupta and Sibli. They studied the relation between positive intergroup contact and motivation to undertake collective action in the Maori people in New Zealand. As you maybe know, in New Zealand, native Maori people are disadvantaged compared to European New Zealanders ever since the British colonized New Zealand and set up a lot of laws that disadvantaged the Maori. In the study, they investigated whether Maori still support laws beneficial to their ethnic group if they had friendships with European New Zealanders. More than a thousand Maori filled in the questionnaires about their relationships with the Europeans and about their involvement in collective action that promotes equal rights for them. It turned out that the more friendships the Maori had with Europeans, the less they supported policies that would give Maori back their holy land. So positive contact basically blocked the Maori's claim for equal social status. And the next example illustrates these paradoxical effects in a very different kind of disadvantaged group. A study by Becker and colleagues was conducted right after the proposal of a law for prohibiting same-sex marriages in California. The researchers wanted to investigate how social support, in this case positive contact with people that were disadvantaged, affected and undermined tendency of the disadvantaged to participate in collective action. In the study, LGBT individuals who are a disadvantaged minority filled in questionnaires about their willingness to participate in public protests against prohibiting same-sex marriage. LGBT members were told to think of a close relationship with a heterosexual, so a member of the advantage group, who either supported or didn't support gay marriage. The results show that a close relationship with a heterosexual friend could reduce the intention to participate in public protest. So this again shows how positive contact with an advantage group can have an unintended effect. But importantly, they also found that this relationship was moderated by the heterosexual friend's opinion about same-sex marriage. So the tendency for collective action reduced only if the heterosexual friend was supportive of the same-sex marriage. Recently, Hassler and colleagues conducted a large-scale study on these paradoxical effects of intergroup contact, especially on collective action for social change. So they wanted to know if these paradoxical findings are on average reliable or not, and how the strength of the association between contact and support for social change depends on measures and analytical decisions that are used. They did this with a large-scale multinational test, including different ethnic as well as sexual or religious minorities. They used different measures of positive contact and reduced support for social change, and they also varied a lot of their analysis decisions. 
So with all these variations, they could perform a very rigorous test to see if positive contact really undermines support for social change under all these different conditions. The analysis revealed that correlations between contact and support for social change among disadvantaged groups could range from positive to negative, so results weren't very consistent. And you can see this in the slide for the relation between contact and support for social change in LGBTs. The correlations between intergroup contact and support for social change depend heavily on how the concepts are operationalized and the analytic decisions that we're taking. But overall, there is support for negative correlation between positive contact and support for social change by the disadvantaged group. This study provides robust evidence that disadvantaged group members who have more frequent positive contact with advantage groups are less supportive of social change. Given all these findings of paradoxical effects, we'll present an integrative model to try and explain all of them. Like we did in the rest of the presentation, we formulate this model from the viewpoint of the disadvantaged group. To better understand why intergroup contact can lead to paradoxical negative effects, we have to look more closely into what exactly happens during the contact. Suppose that we have a commonality-based intergroup contact. It can be, for example, in the form of a cross-group friendship or a larger planned intergroup gathering. As already mentioned, evidence shows that such contact can reduce the motivation for collective action among the disadvantaged group, and this can happen through at least three psychological mechanisms. First, if the emphasis is on the commonalities between groups, then the disadvantaged attitudes towards the advantaged group members improve. Because the disadvantaged members form more positive attitudes towards the advantaged members, they increase their belief that the advantaged would act more fair in discrimination-prone situations. This means that they get falsely optimistic about the outgroup actions and find it difficult to perceive the advantaged group as a driving agent of inequality. Such optimism makes them blind to current inequalities. It reduces their worries about the fairness of the system, and they start devoting less attention to inequalities in it. If the disadvantaged group is either unaware and inattentive of inequalities, or satisfied with the current situation, then it has no reason to support or organize collective action to reduce the inequalities. A second possible mechanism brings social identity theory into the picture. When emphasizing common identity, the salience of the in-group identity along with the discrimination associated with it reduces, again deflecting attention away from inequalities. The third mechanism has to do with the relationship between perceived personal and collective discrimination. A positive contact experience, where one experiences little or no discrimination, can lead the disadvantage to generalize this feeling of reduced personal discrimination to a feeling of reduced collective discrimination. If collective discrimination is perceived as low or non-existent, again, less and less attention is devoted to it because it's not perceived as a problem anymore. We can apply this model to the study one of the Sagai et al. paper, which is the experiment with intergroup contact followed by the allocation of credit points. As mentioned, the study involved both commonality-based contact and non-commonality-based contact. In the commonality-based condition, the disadvantaged members had more positive outgroup attitudes, were more optimistic about how many credits they would get from the advantage group, and they reported giving less attention to their disadvantaged position. The second part of the paper focused on how the Jew-Arab uh, conflict is in Israel. In this case, the upper and lower additional mechanism in the model could also be taken into account. But we cannot be sure how strongly they are present, since the questionnaires focused only on assessing the attitudes and perceived fairness. And they did note reduced collective action among the Arab group who had positive contact experience with the Jewish majority. Similarly, a majority of studies on cross-group friendship, like the study from Sengupta and Sigli about the Maori and European New Zealanders, showed that the number of outgroup friends is correlated with reduced tendencies for collective action among the disadvantaged group. But these studies all do not specify what the friendships look like. For example, are they commonality-based? Do friends discuss the inequalities or do they ignore them? Based on this model, these friendships must have been at least partially commonality-based in a way that they reduced attention to inequalities by one, two or all three mentioned mechanisms. Positive attitudes, increased saliency or of in-group identity or relationship between perceived personal and collective discrimination. 
to get a more precise picture of what is actually happening in these contact situations, additional things should be measured in these studies. For example, is the friendship intimate or very superficial? Or what is the advantaged person's view on the inequality in the situation? And what is the main topic of the conversations these people have? Now that we've come to the end, pretty much, let's shortly sum up the main ideas that we have presented today. We've mentioned different theories of the origins and nature of prejudice, and then concluded that prejudice is an internal part of every one of us and cannot be completely diminished. We can, however, aim to reduce prejudice, for example, with intergroup contact. The majority of the contact research is rooted in Alpert's contact theory, stating that contact between groups under certain conditions can reduce prejudice and improve the quality of intergroup relations. By contrast, we also presented some recent studies which show that intergroup contact can also paradoxically lead to negative effects, particularly to reduce support of the disadvantaged group's motivation for collective action. We've tried to make sense of those findings by integrating them into a theoretical model of commonality-based contact from the perspective of the disadvantaged group. This knowledge of how the negative effects arise from intergroup contact can of course help us to improve intergroup contact in the future. The recent proposal for optimizing intergroup contact is to foster positive attitudes between the groups while still emphasizing the cross-group inequalities and supporting the in-group identity while the two groups interact. Tegai proposed two recent models of intergroup contact that follow this reasoning, the confrontation model and the narrative model. In the confrontation model, also called the social identity model, it is based on explicit emphasis on power differences and associated prejudice. The two groups discuss the issues during the interaction in an open and direct way. The advantage of such interaction is that attention is kept on the inequalities which linger on participants' thoughts long after the contact. A disadvantage, however, would be that because of such a direct format, the discussion can turn into a heated confrontation if it is not properly controlled. This could lead to increased tension between the groups and negative outgroups attitudes, of course, which is not a desired effect. One way to emit those tensions is by using the second model, the narrative one. In this type of contact, participants convey their personal and collective experience with inequality in a storytelling format. In this way, the contact gives rise to personal ties while still emphasizing existing inequalities. It avoids dead-end arguments filled with accusations between the two groups. Unfortunately, this marks the end of our presentation. I will now read out loud the discussion questions if you want to hear them from us. <laughs> and you can also find them in the discussion forum, of course. The first question. In the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned Aronson's idea of a jigsaw technique. In a jigsaw classroom, students from different social groups are brought together and have to cooperate. This was proven to be effective in a variety of countries. We could say that the international programs at Gai Leuven are also structured in this way because students from different cultures have to cooperate in a lot of group assignments. So our question to you, in your own experience, what is the effect of the intergroup contact in Gai Leuven on you? Who can be seen as part of an advantage or disadvantage group here? And did this contact change your outgroup attitudes? And what about your motivation for collective action? The second question. We mostly talked about the viewpoint of the disadvantaged group in our presentation. What do you think changes in the attitude or behavior of the advantaged group in commonality-based versus non-commonality-based contact? Question three. Throughout the presentation, we have focused mainly on the premise of the contact theory that equality in relations is an important factor for improving intergroup attitudes. But how about the other conditions that Alpert's contact theory proposes, such as intergroup cooperation, common goals, and support of authorities, law, and custom? Could these also have paradoxical effects, for example? And then a fourth question. African Americans who have friendships with whites show less support for ethnic activism that promotes equal rights for African Americans in the US. Can you explain this? For example, using the model on slide 27. Is there anything that this model cannot explain?
Thank you for your attention. We look forward to hearing your thoughts in the discussion forum.